Welcome to the incredible story of Emily's near-death experience. When a devastating collision on the highway threatens to end her life, Emily embarks on a journey of self-discovery and forgiveness as she is enveloped in a wave of love and peace. Follow Emily as she confronts the pain of her past and the possibility of a higher power in this transformative tale of love and understanding. Don't miss a moment of this amazing journey of healing and spiritual awakening. Like and subscribe now to join Emily on this incredible journey and get more inspiring and transformative content like this. Tuesday, July 15, 2002, 11.58 p.m. It was a beautiful summer day, and traffic on the freeway was heavy. I was in charge of our minivan. I was quite stressed. My husband and I had just returned from a trip out of state with his mother, father, and three dogs the night before. His father had suffered a stroke the week before, and they planned to stay with us while he recovered. It turned out to be a whole year, I should probably tell you that at the time, we had six children, ages 17 to 5, and a dog of our own. Life had thrown us all a curve, but we were dealing with it as it came. We have always taught our children the value of family. I needed to get my paycheck so I could go grocery shopping before going to work at 3 p.m. I had a tight but manageable schedule. God had a different plan and a great sense of humor. A car with a flat tire was parked in the median strip, on the left, and a group of Boy Scouts was sitting on the grass. I was driving in the fast lane with the flow of traffic when the car in front of me slowed to go into the grassy median to assist them. As I pressed my foot on the brake to slow down, I noticed a semi's grill in my rearview mirror. Not the semi. The semi's grill. It was literally my worst nightmare come true. I was terrified and terrified. I can't believe I'm going to die today. I exclaimed aloud. It was only about three seconds from the time I saw him until I was hit, but those three seconds completely changed my life and me. Time ceased to exist. It became eternal. Throughout the process, I remained alert, oriented, and driving. I was in my body but removed from Earth's time frame. There was no sound. Everything was quiet and calm. Throughout the conversation, I spoke aloud while his responses took the form of thoughts in my head. With the passage of time came an overwhelming sense of love that grew stronger and stronger. The panic was replaced by love, which gave me such a peaceful feeling that I was no longer afraid. I was getting a lot of hugs. I'd never experienced love like this before. I had an instinct that this was God. Consider someone who loves you deeply. Now multiply that feeling by about a million and you might get an idea of how loved I felt. I had the impression that there were two more people with me. I'm not sure how I know this, but one of them was my grandmother. It took seven years to figure out who the other person was. I had no idea who it was at the time. I'll explain how I found out later in this story. I really wanted to cry, but I didn't have time. Most of us are taught to believe in God throughout our lives. I was raised in a strict Catholic household by parents who did not model what they expected of us. Okay. I believed, but I was furious at him because of my abusive childhood and life in general. Now I had proof, enough proof for me, that there is a God. The next thing I said was, oh, sh hash. I messed this up. There truly is a God. I was embarrassed by my language and my knowledge. I quickly apologized, oh, sorry. His response to me was even more love and a sense of my child, calm down, everything is fine. I truly felt like his child, and it was a very safe and warm environment. He has very gentle and loving hands. With that, I had a colorized review of my life in front of me to see and feel. I needed to see and feel all the good I'd done, and the good I didn't even realize I'd done. I could actually feel each person's joy when I touched their lives in a loving way. For the first time in my life, I was caught doing something right. Throughout the performance, he exclaimed, I am so proud of you. I was overjoyed to have made him proud because I had no idea what that felt like because I always felt like I couldn't do anything right. The most joy came from reflecting on my random acts of kindness because I was able to feel the difference I made in someone's life that I hadn't realized at the time. And I had no idea who they were. Small acts of kindness mean a lot to God. Also, I had to see and feel all the hurtful things I had done, even the ones I didn't realize I had done. I had to feel the pain I had caused others. But, you know how they say in prayers that one day we will stand before God and be judged? God was not passing judgment on me. I was judging myself while looking at my actions. With God by my side loving me. And, believe me, no one can judge me harsher than I already do. It was similar to being caught by my parents doing something wrong. I was so embarrassed during the hurtful review that I couldn't hide. What different choices could you have made? He was asking. What are you taking away from this? Not yelling at me, how could you do that? Or you're going to hell. This was clearly not the wrathful God I had been taught to worship. The most difficult part was realizing he had already forgiven me. 
I was having trouble forgiving myself. He demonstrated how I was unable to accept his love. Without first absolving myself. Punishing myself did not make me better in his eyes, instead, he desired that I accept his love. It was easier for me to look at my life openly and honestly once I accepted that God only loved. I wanted to learn everything I could. I had a lot of questions. God loves me in the same way that I love my children. Even when they make a mistake, I still love them. I disagree with their actions, but that does not diminish my affection for them. I feel sorry for them, and I make them accept responsibility for their actions. I'd taken parenting classes and read everything I could get my hands on so I wouldn't make the same parenting mistakes my parents did. He demonstrated that, even if I wasn't physically abusing my children, I was killing them with my words. That is simply unacceptable. I could feel their anguish. I felt like a complete failure. I just kept saying, I'm so sorry, over and over. He simply continued to love me. When the life review was finished, he revealed to me why I came to earth. I was astounded. I was astounded by how important we all are to God. Particularly how important I am to God. I didn't think he even knew I existed. I had been beating myself up for years, and his question to me was, why would I go to all this trouble to make you exactly the way you are if I wanted you to try to be like someone else? Nobody else could have done the job I came here to do the way he wanted me to. That is why it is critical that we refrain from passing judgment on one another. Some of us have come to teach, others to learn, and still others to do both. He allowed me to question him. My first question was, how could he have given me the parents I had? It was explained to me why I had the parents, childhood, and life that I did. I requested it. It was so obvious to me. I had to go through it all to learn what I needed to know in order to continue working here. I was making a lot of bad decisions because I wasn't making a list. Anning to or trusting myself. I was doing what I thought I should be doing. I felt like a mouse in a maze, trying to find my way but getting nowhere. I realized that earth is a school, and when we finish, we take a final exam, the life review, and then we graduate and return home. Everything made complete sense. The lesson was straightforward. All it's about love. God's love for us and how well we love ourselves and others. Finally, he showed me what I needed to do. I remember confidently declaring, I can do that. I was desperate to do it. I believe I was shown this to assist me in making a decision, because the next question in front of me was, do you want to stay or go? Oh, I have a choice? Even though my good far outweighed my bad, and I desperately wanted to stay in his loving embrace, I needed to fix the hurtful things as soon as possible. I didn't want to leave so many things unfinished before leaving. I also desired to live on this planet knowing that God loved me. But I have to stay, I said almost in a whisper, very reluctantly. My only regret is that I spoke so quickly because the second I did, the entire movie in front of me closed down and my conversation with God was over. I was having a wonderful visit with God, my grandmother, and a friend from the other side one second. During this conversation, I could imagine us sharing a cup of coffee. Only. My hands were tightly gripped on the van steering wheel, I was still driving, and I was thinking, I cannot believe this is happening to me. I couldn't believe how much I'd learned in just three seconds. I had a lot of unanswered questions. I wished for more time. I desired more affection. I didn't want it to be over. I couldn't believe how much my brain could do at once. I was disappointed because I could feel the edges all around me. But I had made my decision. It was over in an instant. I was literally dragged back into reality. Time. Earth's everything had vanished except his love, my grandmother, and a friend. You're a genius. Take your foot off the brake and floor the gas, I was told in my head. I didn't ask any questions and simply followed orders. The semi hit me as I hit the car in front of me. I clipped the car and safely pushed it into the median. The truck did not flip over. I drove about 100 feet further and stopped in the median because I didn't know what was going to happen and didn't want to be in the middle of it. I want to emphasize that if I had said I wanted to go, I would have left before the accident occurred. My family would have assumed that I was killed by a semi truck. The truth was that my body would have died horribly, not me. I was still being hugged safely in my cocoon of God's love at the point of impact. I was completely unaffected by the accident. A few hours later, things were different. I refused to go to the hospital because I was in good health. Never, ever make that blunder. After an accident, it is always a good idea to get checked out. I sat in my van, the entire back blown out, hugging myself because I didn't want to lose the feeling of tremendous love that God had given me because it was still with me. I was also terrified of looking back and seeing what had happened. As a nurse, I felt it was my responsibility to assist the injured, but I couldn't handle one more thing. I'm not sure how long it took the cops to arrive, but when the cop opened the door to my van, while I was still trying to breathe, 
I burst into tears. When he opened the door, the cocoon of love disintegrated. It took him a while to realize I wasn't hurt physically. The feeling of God's love was now just a memory, and I emotionally crumbled. I don't know how you did it, but you saved a lot of lives today because no one was hurt, he said. I was unable to tell him what had occurred. It was difficult for me to believe. I was speechless for the first time in my life, which does not happen very often. Just ask anyone who knows who I am. I started hurting all over my body hours after the accident and couldn't move my neck. That night, my husband drove me to the emergency room. The doctor was surprised that I only had whiplash. The staff was perplexed as to why I was still here. I realized why I was still here. It was my choice. I didn't say anything to anyone, not even my husband, because I knew if I told them what had happened, they'd admit me to the psychiatric ward. I didn't think anyone was going to believe me. Also, I mentioned earlier that during my life review, I was clearly shown my purpose on earth and the work I had left to do. When the accident was over, I had no idea why I had come here or what I had left to do. It is still on the tip of my tongue. As soon as I said, I have to stay, the knowledge was gone. So I'm back to being a little mouse in a maze, trying to find my way with everyone else. When things get tough, I remember what I told myself that day, I can do that. It keeps me grounded and on track. I am certain that God is watching me, and I strive to make Him proud. Every morning, I keep a first grade picture of myself by my bed to remind me that I am a child of God. When confronted with a difficult situation, I take a moment to consider my options because I do not want to revisit it in a negative light. I'm not perfect, but I make every effort to do the right thing. As a footnote, my husband totaled my car seven days prior to this accident while I was in it. We were both unharmed in the accident. On that particular day, neither of us had a near-death experience. I was still irritated with him about the car. It was my first car, the one I chose, and the registration was in my name. That car was fantastic. Talk about misplaced priorities. If he hadn't totaled my car, I would have been driving a Mazda 323 instead of an Astro van. This just adds to my belief that everything happens for a reason. That day, there would have been no options. That semi would have smashed right through me. I had a hard time praying before the accident. Now I converse with him in the same way I would with anyone else, anytime and anywhere. In fact, a week before the truck accident, I walked out to the middle of my front yard after the first accident. I know they say God doesn't give us more than we can handle, I screamed at the sky. But you're completely blowing it right now. So just come down here and tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it so you can go away. Come inside, the neighbors are watching, my poor husband said as he grabbed my arm. I had no idea he was listening to me, so be careful what you ask for because I discovered, very unexpectedly, how much he cared about me. I don't have to scream at him any longer. Now I see what he was trying to tell me. His response came through loud and clear. The year following my accident was probably one of the most difficult of my life, and I often wondered why I was so stupid to stay and not leave when I had the chance. What the heck were you thinking? I kept yelling at myself. Looking back on what I learned and how fortunate I am today, I'm glad I stayed. When I see the sun's rays streaming through the clouds, the Holy Spirit, I get homesick. God is the light to me. That is Him reminding me how much He loves me and that I am never alone and one day I'll be able to return to him forever. Until then, I intend to have a good time. Every obstacle is now an adventure for me, and I'm always looking for the lesson. It's a fantastic game. This makes life so much easier. The fact that I am a church orphan was probably the most difficult thing for me after my NDE and working with the dying. It's difficult for me to sit through the mass without getting up and screaming, no, you guys, he's lying. This isn't how it works. I've tried a variety of religious services but have yet to find one that feels like home. Actually, I feel like I spend 12 hours a day, two days a week at church, at work. I'd like to find a church where other people understand what I'm saying. Regarding my friend on the other side. I went to church two days after the accident, with my cervical collar on and a very sore body. I had a lot of thanking to do. Before Mass, a lady I know approached me and inquired about my accident. One of her questions to me was, who are you with? Ah. Uh, God and my grandmother, I replied timidly. Who else? She asked, smiling. I was hesitant to tell her about my mysterious friend from the other side, but I did. She didn't think I was crazy and told me I could ask for their name. I was skeptical at first, but after speaking with her, I felt much better. After Mass, another lady I didn't know approached me and inquired about the accident. We almost had the same conversation. This had not been the first time this had happened to me. We were brought together by a common experience. A near-death experience. They were aware of what I was aware of. 
they were both carrying the names of the people with them. I asked every day for a while and eventually gave up trying to get the name of this person who is still with me. Seven years later, I was watching a TV show about near-death experiences and spirit guides from the other side. They demonstrated a different method of requesting a name. Before going to bed that night, I asked aloud to be given their name in a dream and to please help me remember it in the morning. Before my eyes opened, my brain awoke, and I had a name in my head, similar to the conversation I had with God during my life review. Amy was my given name. When I tried to argue with it, it just got louder and more insistent in my head, so I knew it was real. The majority of my family and friends now have names. Some have more than one, and some were given the name simply by asking, like I was told to do seven years before. The more I am willing to accept assistance from the other side, the more assistance I receive. I gave up trying to explain everything. I am constantly in contact with Amy. If you're not sure if you have someone with you, let me explain. When I have a problem with something, I go to bed and dream about it, and when I wake up in the morning, I have a solution. Amy is assisting me. There are times when I don't even need to go to sleep to get an answer. Her assistance has been and continues to be invaluable to me. I'm hoping to see her again one day.